Welcome everyone. My name is Seth Green and I am pleased to welcome you to the History of Normality featuring Tal Arbel, a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. As I welcome you, I want to acknowledge this is a heavy time. I know I'm not alone in watching the invasion into Ukraine with grave concern. And we all know the pain and difficulty this brings for members of our university community from UK and Russia and the rest of Europe and for all of us. And I know you're all here to hear about the history of normality. And so we'll move on to the topic at hand, but I just wanted to acknowledge that this is an issue that is weighing on all of us. And we'll put into the chat a virtual gathering next week that we'll have exploring the crisis in Ukraine. Okay, so pausing there, um, we are here for a very special reason today. Uh, earlier this month, we announced the launch of the Novel Knowledge Series, a joint initiative with the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge to engage lifelong learners in multidisciplinary courses that challenge conventional perspectives and encourage new ways of approaching longstanding questions. This is an extraordinary opportunity for our Graham community and I just wanna thank our partners at IFK. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, IFK opened in the fall of 2015 at the University of Chicago and nearly overnight in academic uh, timelines, it has become the leading destination globally for multidisciplinary thinkers who seek to challenge accepted perspectives within and outside university settings. Uh, I consider it to be one of the true jewels of the University of Chicago and I am so excited to be able to bring the path-breaking ideas that are emerging from the Institute to lifelong learners. Uh, today, you are going to hear about one of those courses, the History of Normality. Uh, and that will be taught this spring with summer courses coming on the relationship of humans and machines and the role of planets in our science and culture. Uh, and let me maybe ask for us to take down that slide and we'll feature um, our incredible guest today. Uh, hopefully you can all uh, see Tal Arbel on your screen uh, while I share a little bit about her background. She is a cultural historian of science. Her primary research interests include the history of the behavioral and mind sciences, the sociology of expertise, and the social technologies that sustain the liberal democratic state. Her manuscript in progress, fact, culture, polling, and the politics of objectivity examines the global circulation of opinion surveys and market research methods in the aftermath of World War II and the influence this scientific practice had on what knowledge claims are considered trustworthy in the public domain. Her new project, A Scientific Childhood, revisits the lives of children who served as subjects of observation and experiment from the 1920s in the 1950s, something that inevitably we may ultimately talk about in today's conversation. So as I mentioned, today's conversation is previewing a course that I will be offering at Graham this spring. And I thought maybe to lay the groundwork for the rest of our discussion, I would start Paul, by just asking you to take four or five minutes and offer a snapshot of the big ideas in the history of normality. And then we'll jump into some more specific questions. Thank you again for joining us. Oh, you're on mute though. Let's see. Uh, that might be on my fault here. I think I, think I need to give you the permission. Uh, so hold on. Um, you can do an apologies to, to Tal. I had meant to make her a co-host and by now, two years into Zoom, you would think I'd be more able to, to do that. Um, you... Okay. Great, you should now be able to unmute Tal. Oh, okay. Perfect, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Seth, uh, for, uh, for inviting me and um, for this exciting opportunity to um, become part of the, um, of the Graham School community. And thank you all for uh, joining today. Uh, I know it's a Friday. Um, and uh, I'm excited uh, that so many people came to listen. Uh, so um, this course is, um, 
is trying to do something a little different. Historians typically study phenomena that stand out from the commonplace. They pay more attention to madness than to sanity, eccentricity than conformity, uh, homosexuality than heterosexuality, or in the history of science and medicine, uh, rare syndromes, aberrant behaviors, and brilliant or peculiar minds than to the vast nondescript domain of the ordinary. What's conventional, usual, and expectable is usually taken for granted. We often think it requires no special consideration or elaboration since we all know what it is. And yet normality has an extraordinarily powerful effect on how people behave. Conception of the normal are used to sort people into jobs and screen out allegedly abnormal people from valued social roles. Corporation, the military, even athletic teams often use psychological tests in attempts to ensure potential recruits are within norms. And legal system use standards of normality when bringing people to trial and allowing defenses against charges of criminal behavior. Even those who want to be different use a conception of the normal as a guide, as the would you rather be normal or weird questioned in the dating app OkCupid okay clearly proves. As sociologist Alan Horowitz has noted, one dilemma in the study of normality is that in most cases, no formal rules or standards indicate what conditions are actually normal. The lack of standards for defining normality has led many to look for statistical distributions where the normal is whatever trait most people in the group display. This is one of the reasons why historians trace modern notions of normality to statistical ideas, which came about in the early 19th century, which is exactly where the course starts. This difficulty with defining normality and determining what's normal furnished a lively scientific discourse about human beings and their behavior and became the preoccupation of the human or social and psychological sciences, uh, which rose, which came into being uh, during the 19th century. Focusing on this discourse, the course looks closely at the theories and methods that these experts, psychiatrists and criminologists, sexologists and child development specialists have devised to distinguish the normal from the pathological and attempt to stabilize the meaning of normal. One such method is, um, just to give an example, is craniometry, the measurement of the skull and facial structure. It's a method we uh, um, discuss in the course, which was central for the work of physical uh, anthropologists in the 19th century. The Italian psychiatrist and sociologist Cesare Lombroso, uh, whom we read in the course, uh, seeking phys physical evidence of the so-called criminal type, used it to examine and categorize prison inmates and differentiate them from so-called normal people, or this is a de decent citizen, as he called it. Another aspect of the, the course considers is the tension between scientific norms and cultural norms, um, or the tension between factual description and modes of evaluation. We know that the word normal often suggests something more than conformity to a standard or a type. While exhibiting the authority and credibility of objective natural knowledge, the normality designation are almost always normative. They imply what should be, not just what is. When we say that something or someone is normal, it always somehow suggests that what's normal is also good and healthy, right and worthy. Um, example, an example we would uh, consider uh, um, we'll discuss in the course is the new field of sexology and the way it had defined what normal sexuality is and what perversion is um, and how in the context of this medical discourse heterosexuality became the model of uh, normal uh, what normal sexuality is um, and uh, of course that was uh, um, within uh, what our scientific description, there was also affirmation of cultural values of what uh, people thought was um, a morally uh, and culturally um, worthy way of behaving and interacting. A third big idea that will feature in our discussion throughout the course is what I call the regulative and generative function of normality. As philosopher Ian Hacking claims, the word normal must have become popular because it allowed to bridge the fact value distinction and close the gap between what is and what ought to be. This is part of what made this benign and sterile sounding concept one of the most powerful ideological tools of the 20th century. 
In other words, the normal isn't just a figure of knowledge. It acts upon us, causes us to change our behavior. We go on a diet that will bring us closer to the normal range, and we do therapy and take antidepressants in order to feel more normal. But perhaps more significantly, the normal can have significant effect on the lives of those who fall outside the norm, those defined as abnormal, pathological, or deviant. The course is therefore concerned with the, also with the corrective and disciplinary project that judgments of normality have served for 200 years. From isolation in special institutions to therapeutic intervention and treatments of various sort for both the body and the mind. In this sense, the course isn't merely a history of ideas. We also discuss the ways in which scientific discourses have contributed to the creation of new subject formation and bodily experience and to new kinds of people. We will examine the born criminal, the autistic child, and the chronically depressed, all kinds of people that came to being uh, within these uh, and through interaction with scientific discourses on the map. Thank you, Tal, for that really powerful snapshot. And you can all see why I said IFK has many of the world-renowned thinkers that are changing the way that we look at the world. And I want to kind of dive deep because I have been so fascinated by this topic. And you know, what's amazing to me is how many times I see normalcy now that we've had our original conversation and how it's presented as science. And, and I think this idea of scientizing normalcy which I would never have words to be able to, to verbalize, but which I had seen all the time. Um, when I was growing up, I just became, you know, kind of accustomed to it. So I was almost desensitized as a parent, you know, seeing all the BMI charts and all, it, it's just kind of something that I had just treated as part of life. And what was fascinating in our conversation is this started 200 years ago. This is not always how we've approached you know, this, this idea of, of normalcy and, and differentiation with the pathological. And so maybe we can start there in our conversation and just hear from you, you know, what scholars see as the origin of this movement to scientize normalcy? Um, yeah, so even though it seems like the idea of normalcy has always been with us, it's a fairly recent concept. And it's in fact, uh, originated in um, medicine, uh, in a medical discourse uh, of the, so I don't know if it's so much to scientize normality as normality uh, has become a popular concept that uh, we kind of forgot about its medical and scientific origins. But in fact, we all live in a, a normal and normalizing world that feeds on uh, the input of, uh, of science. Um, and this is why uh, um, um, this is why uh, this is a course in history of science, even though it considers all the time cultural, social, and um, and questions of uh, cultural and social questions and questions of value that are associated with normality today. So. It really begins uh, um, as a principle of organizing knowledge about people and their behavior that came into usage in the early to mid 19th century. Um, the word first appeared in French anatomical and physiological writing to describe ordinary or typical functioning of the healthy organism uh, as part of the entry of biological concepts and theories into the medical field. And then uh, from there, it was taken by the first sociologist, Durkheim, uh, Auguste Comte, uh, and was uh, applied to the description of society. We started having healthy societies, normal societies, and pathological societies. And uh, from there, it spread into many other fields uh, and became, um, in a sense, a mode of thinking. Uh, within uh, uh, the human sciences. Um, so the core seeks to understand how this idea of normality with its numerical factuality and standardizing tendencies entered the world that still thought uh, in enlightenment terms of human nature and morality, how it operate, was operationalized within the context of medicine and science and how it acquired the cultural authority it has today. What's interesting to me is how this technical use, which was, it was in, actually until the early 20th century, normal was a technical term uh, that uh, lay people did not use or that was not in circulation. It, it shaped the popular notion that we have today. It was in a sense, normality 
um, is a great scientific success, <laughs> one of the greatest. Uh, um, we, we're not aware of it because we're busy with, you know, rockets and, you know, uh, um, tr travel to space and, but, but this uh, being normal is, uh, is one of the great achievements of modern science. Well, so I wanna pick up there because one of the points you're making in that is that this starts with individuals, but essentially it becomes institutionalized. And you know now we kind of see it in systems and almost take it for granted. Uh, and so how does this way of thinking, right? Starting with just a few people and then suddenly we see it now embedded in systems. How, how does it become systemic? And, can we talk about some of those examples? You know, so what are some examples today of how we can see normality in our systems, in the way that we judge, look, examine, evaluate? You know, you know, how, how can we just for, for our audience, we've talked about some of this, see that in, in our everyday almost. Yeah, so uh, there's too many ways it, 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 in which it is institutionalized. First, it was picked up by some of the, you know, of these um, objects of knowledge uh, by people themselves. A, a prominent example is how that we, we we're going to study in the course is how um, educated readers uh, got into their hands this famous um, um, book. Psychopathia Sexualis uh, of um, the great textbook of uh, uh, sexology and started reading and uh, applying some of these concepts to themselves and using them uh, to define their experiences and um, start forming an identity using this uh, medical discourse. So there was a circulation of uh, these ideas um, within uh, uh, the broader community. Um, the, the second meaning of institutionalization is actual institutions that were responsible for normalizing. Uh, we're discussing at length uh, the rise of the therapeutic mental asylum uh, that in the late 18th century um, became in charge for a, a designated population that was deemed abnormal and uh, in which in, in their uh, they devised various forms of treatments to bring uh, these deviants back into uh, normal order. Um, a, a current example, as a mother of a three-year-old, uh, is a developmental milestone, which is uh, sort of at the end of the course we're going to consider and how these are now embedded in every um, school setting in every uh, sort of early childhood um, uh, institution we can think about. Uh, and we measure our children uh, and become very anxious when they don't meet a developmental milestone on time. And this was a new idea that uh, was formed uh, in the 1930s, uh, that children have to go through these uh, stages. Otherwise, they are something is wrong with them. Well, so I want to talk about where we are right now, because this is, in my mind, and, and I know from our conversation, yours as well, a really important moment to be grappling with constructions of normality, because we are, in some ways, even further along in these constructions. Um, and then in other ways, our society is really deconstructing a lot of this, if you think about maybe gender norms, some of the other areas. And so I'm curious if you can speak to what you see as the current trend lines or, you know, the, the different competing tensions maybe right now over how this gets defined. And then um, with your crystal ball, I'm, I'm curious kind of, you know, what do you see the outlook as we look to the, to the future of, of how we think about some of these concepts? Yeah, so the course is uh, heavily focused on the 19th century and early 20th century, the era of, uh, of normality, as I call it, which sort of is in line as a, with some of the big, bigger development, the rise of bureaucracy, industrial world, the world in which standards and standard, standardization matter uh, a lot of having uh, norms that govern, govern individual differences. 
There are scholars today who famously Todd Rose uh, from Harvard University School of Education. Uh, he wrote a few years ago a bestseller called The End of Average. Um, and he claims that we are entering an era of uh, individualized trajectories and individual different where individual differences replace notions of normality and averageness. Um, and of course, this is, corresponds with the rise of individual uh, individualized medicine uh, and other forms of uh, um, specialized or tailored, individually tailored uh, uh, programs. Of course, there is, uh, which you mentioned in our conversation, the rise in data gathering uh, operations and mechanisms, uh, which still very much, and algorithms, which still very much rely on uh, certain ideas of, uh, of the user. One last thing that I think is a hopeful uh, thought is to look at how children or youth are pushing against these regime of normality that um, at least in my generation, I think uh, older generations were very much raised on. Uh, we have more and more bi you know, non-binary, uh, children, children who reject gender uh, definition, or at least rigid de gender definition, um, who choose polymorphous or amorphous uh, forms of uh, sexuality, uh, who refuse to participate in this uh, homosexual, heterosexual, uh, um, sexual orientation, um, taxonomy, uh, etc. So, um, yeah, we, we tend to pathologize them, uh, but there's more and more of them. So <laughs> hopefully they win. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is a, a big topic that you're endeavoring as is appropriate for a postdoctoral researcher at IFK. Uh, and we have a question in the chat from Galina of Shachara uh, that says, can you share the course syllabus? And maybe I'll just broaden that question a bit by saying, you know, how are you approaching teaching this course and, and what's on your reading list? Yeah, so I do um, really, I try to do two things. One is uh, I'm an historian, so we read primary sources. I try to really focus on not on scholarly articles, but on reading those thinkers. And so we read medical and scientific treatises, uh, some of them fascinating and peculiar. Um, and um, so it's not about current ideas, but about meeting those thinkers in their time as they grapple with this problem of normality. Um, and um, and I also put an emphasis as we go along on uh, uh, the interaction of these subjects or objects of those observations uh, and the scientific discourses and how they sort of um, interacted or suffered uh, um, from sort of the advent of, of normality. So, and the production of new kinds of way of uh, to be, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. We're starting with, um, with really with the rise of um, physiological thinking in the medical field and then in the sociological field, we're, we are reading uh, Emil Durkheim, the great sociologist, uh, and his text on the sociological method. Uh, we move to read some of the great physical anthropologists um, of the 19th century, uh, focusing on Lombroso and uh, his uh, born criminal. Um, we move forward to, uh, there's a whole unit on sexology. Uh, we're gonna read Freud. Uh, and his uh, three essays on the theory of sexuality, um, the Kinsey reports, uh, and we move to a statistical part of the course uh, where we uh, are gonna meet uh, Adolf Ketelet, the Belgian astronomer who invented the average man, uh, Francis Galton, um, and later uh, child development uh, 
thinkers who grapple with the normal child and the abnormal child. And we end with the case study of the autism epidemic. Uh, hopefully, if we get there in eight weeks, uh, <laughs> uh, to rethink through, uh, uh, through the autistic spectrum some of these, um, um, th this regime of, of normality. And we have a kind of uh, parallel question here from Barbara Andrews. How will the course be structured, lecture, discussion, readings? Um, I think you've already spoken to the readings part. Is it a little bit of a mix of, of lecture and discussion in your mind? Is it full discussion? What does that look like in terms of your sharing your knowledge and facilitating the knowledge in the room? Yeah, I, I, I'll give a bit of background and contextualization. And I really am a great believer in engaging directly uh, with, 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 with historical texts. And uh, yeah, I hope we're going to have uh, mm -hmm. mostly a discussion and a, a very lively one. Uh, Katie Byrne asks, is the concept of normality basically rooted in fear, fear of being cast out? Uh, you can say that you, we all want to fit in. Uh, the question is, you know, how to do a history of, 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 of something like this. And I go to the, to the concept itself, the concept of normality, rather than um, I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist. Uh, I'm an historian of science. And, and normality, the concept, the notion, has a very clear um, historical trajectory. Uh, and I think it's very interesting to see how this medical and scientific notion or meanings of normality uh, fed into this, uh, I guess, human universal um, fear of being cast out. Why do we speak that language and not another language? So Sheila Barrett has a really interesting question that I wrestled with too. On one hand, you want to be normal. <laughs> On the other hand, you want to be excellent. And so she asks, what becomes of excellence in the pursuit of the normal? And, and how do those concepts interact? Because they're, they're two almost different drivers that you see in society. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, I'm curious kind of how you see that interaction and, and how you even see it historically once normality becomes more and more of a dominant force. Right, so so there is a, a moment, a pivotal moment, with Francis Galton and the, <clears throat> and the emergence of the normal distribution that normality becomes associated with mediocrity, uh, and the average is no longer an ideal as it was for Quetelet and for many of the thinkers of the nineteenth century, um, but becomes something to improve on, uh, and that is. It, those who know Francis Gelton is part of the movement of eugenics and ideas about um, um, making the human race better. Uh, and sort of that led um, many thinkers, uh, and we focus on some of the development developers of the intelligence testing movement that were focused on uh, the upper end of the spectrum. Uh, and we're looking to uh, find ways of uh, um, um, pushing for excellency. So Santiago Meja uh, asks, what happens with the notion of, of health, uh, meaning body and I'm mental sorry, health? Sorry, I, I, I missed you. So, oh, say again. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Santiago uh, Mejia, kind of building on that question of excellence, asks, what happens with the notion of health Kind of both body and mental health Me meaning i think you know how do we think about you know as normalcy comes into the way that we think about our our bodies and our our minds how does that essentially influence us and and, and have impacts on on both of those you know is there maybe even a co connection between you know that definition of normalcy and some of the the different challenges that we face as a society in terms of anxiety and, and uh, eating disorder or, or, or other aspects, you know, where people feel so pressured into that normalcy bound that it actually can be counterproductive. Yeah, I mean, one thing is that the discourse about normal is a medicalizing discourse. 
uh, it takes differences and make them pathological. Uh, and we discussed that with the sort of the invention of mental illness or the, the sort of the uh, taking non-normative forms of, of behavior and thinking and turning them into illnesses. And that's a force that we see. Uh, it's true about uh, various bodies that fall outside the norm, um, whether they are uh, within a culture that, for example, abhors fat or uh, cultures that is, um, uh, has um, uh, fear of disability. Uh, so yes, patholo pathologizing is part of the culture of normal. Uh, and there's also the other aspect, of course, that normal as a regulative ideal generates uh, that nobody can meet. There's nobody that is totally normal uh, uh, or truly normal or exactly normal, uh, that it's, it generates all kinds of anxieties around normalcy uh, that we can see um, in various uh, areas in, in the field of mental health in particular. Michael Price uh, says, normality began with statistical thinking. Nonetheless, statistics is about distribution and variability. How was the concept of variability eclipsed by the concept of the mean in social and cultural thinking? Oh, that's a complex question and we're devoting <laughs> at least one <laughs> meeting to it. Uh, yeah, the, the mean was more important because variability was considered to be errors, at least by Ketelet, uh, errors in measurement. Um, uh, then with Galton, variability was uh, important, but uh, um, he projected the idea that this variability represents uh, a certain kind of normal distribution that mirrors uh, what we see in uh, in nature, and the normal was still important because we needed to. Uh, this was the majority of people, and we needed to improve on it. I hope I'm under, I'm answering it uh, uh, sufficiently for uh, for the question. So Ivan asks a really interesting question. Uh, she uh, says, you mentioned 19th century scientific roots for concepts of normality, but how do you approach orthodox societies that transmit implicit expectations and norms? So, you know, if we look back thousands of years, we can see um, that within societies, there may be an expectation of, you know, how to um, wear shoes or, or, you know, all sorts of different Kind of norms that are put on people that that predate and so you know how do you think about that and then you know what's new about the the kind of last 200 years right this is a good question obviously social norms existed in every society in every culture uh, throughout history um, normality is a specific very specific regime in in time and place uh, it's about uh, uh, it's about natural norms uh, that become infused with cultural meaning and serve to normalize within social context. Uh, but normality and, uh, and norms are not the same, uh, do not have the same meanings. Uh, the interesting thing is how scientific norms like you know, the, the, your thyroid, you know, the, the, I have a, a, a thyroid deficiency uh, illness. You know, so I, you know, I'm checking regularly to see if those levels are, you know, are within the norm or, you know, other ways we, we you know, whether your heart functions, you know, are within the norm, how this kind of thinking transformed uh, the way we think about people, societies, behaviors, relationships, um, the way we think about my thyroid gland. This is. Thank you for, for sharing and give us a, a personal <laughs> glimpse into to this topic. Uh, there are a couple other questions about kind of format and, um, and opportunities if, if you miss a class. I'll just mention that typically um, there is recording available to those who are enrolled who have to miss a, a class if, that, if that's something that the instructor is comfortable with. And then the um, maximum number for these types of classes uh, is 18 to 20. And so we are definitely aiming to keep this small and have it be a true seminar where you're in the type of dialogue that Dr. Arbel is describing. Um, we have a question here 
from CB. While the word normal is, as you say, a 20th century construct, surely the concept of normality is not a new one. And we've just begun talking about this. I can think of many examples from earlier history where people were punished for being outside of normal, which is exposing babies. You know, is the scientific basis uh, simply a replacement of religious basis of normality that, that preceded it? So kind of picking up on what we had just been talking about, but slightly different emphasis of the question. Right, that's a very nice formulation. Yeah, I think that it's a, it's a, as it's a regime or a, it became, it started as a technical discourse about how you define a normal range that is associated with health uh, and distinguish it from pathological conditions, um, whether at the level of the organ or the entire organism or then the society as a whole. Um, but yeah, it grew to become, at least as critics uh, have uh, described it, to become a true um, regime of, and a way okay. of, of uh, ordering society that replaced, uh, in a way, um, other important distinctions or other important norms, uh, religious, moral. Um, Andrew Kotler says, although the idea of the normal may be constructed, you're not saying, are you, that it is not useful or valid as a concept to assist with diagnosis of conditions that may be harmful to the subject or in society generally. And I'll maybe just put a specific, um, you know, example on this to kind of draw it out. You know, I know a member of our extended family, um, when uh, uh, she was young, they were kind of able to identify some differences in learning and then actually do some individualized education that was really, you know, positive and, and allowed her to just be, you know, the incredible person that she now is. And so I'm, I'm curious kind of how you think about, you know, some of the value that might be possible and, and how to manage that while these other concerns are, are there. Yeah, obviously I'm, I'm interested in just denaturalizing as an historian, denaturalizing uh, uh, um, normality and to, to show that it's not, just the way things are, but that we made them this way. And also to maybe um, at question some of these efforts that true, uh, they allowed many people uh, with difficulties and with learning disabilities, uh, mental health problems, um, developmental gaps uh, uh, to um, get uh, the help they needed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we obliterated many differences as problems. Right. Um, and maybe some of these did not need to be normalized away. Um, yeah. So this is part of uh, the sort of in the background of the course. The discussion of deviation, Jim Patty writes, from normality is focusing on pathologies but in many cases, aren't there beneficial deviations from the norm? Michael Jordan, Einstein, Mozart are examples of non-normal people we celebrate. You know, will the discussion look at both sides of the curve? I admit that I'm skewed <laughs> toward the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, pathologized, uh, those who, are, who get pathologized. But yeah, we, we discuss, especially uh, when we discuss the development of intelligence testing, uh, um, the sort of the, 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 the scholars or the thinkers we read uh, pr primarily the developer of the IQ test, uh, Louis Terman, the American Louis Terman, um, was very, very interested in the gifted. Um, but we ask as we go along what it means to think that uh, uh, ability or talent uh, or success are, uh, are natural gifts and yeah. are somehow ranked in society in this way. Um, what kind of society it generates. Um, so, Francine McKenna writes, to what extent does accessibility to others' experiences based on social media harm or hurt people's perception of what is normal? And so this is a really interesting, you know, evolution, I imagine, in this whole regime. And I, yeah, I'm curious how you see social media and this, you know, kind of constant onslaught of 
imagery and here's my experience and you know and, and that experience not always being representative we know you know so it's this interesting dynamic how, how do you see that interacting with this regime of normality right this is uh, thankfully beyond my uh, <laughs> area of expertise no, no, no. <laughs> uh, i'm comfortably within you know the 19th century and to the mid 20th century where we didn't have social media no it's i'm, I'm joking it's definitely uh, this uh, you know this constant um, sort of projection of individual experience you can say about it what we you know you can create echo echo chambers where certain things are you know are okay on the other hand um, the um, autistic activists uh, formed their movement via uh, the internet via social media and they still use it as the, the foremost platform uh, to give voice and to allow for uh, um, individuals with, with autism to um, express themselves. Uh, so I, I think it probably has both normalizing and differentiating effects. Uh, sorry for not being able to say something more enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very enlightening and very helpful in terms of a framework. Um, Dana, and I'll make this a shorter part than, than the full question, uh, but picks up on your mention of anthropology and eugenics and asks, will the course inquire cross-culturally into, for example, how the science of anthropology has used progress in quotes as a measuring stick of normality? Yeah, uh, not directly, but we we deal with yes, with with the effort to uh, uh, to characterize racial types, uh, and obviously questions about progress and how these these cultural ideas about what's uh, more advanced and what's more uh, retarded. Uh, um, and how these manifest in what they thought were bodily features and uh, mental capacities. Uh, we, we will discuss that, yes. Peggy Mason, who's one of our eminent faculty at the university and we're proud to say teaches in the Master of Liberal Arts, asks how can one acknowledge pathology without a normal, typical, usual? Pathology does happen. Yeah, well, the answer I can give is not mine is, you know, it's, uh, we read this uh, from his book at the beginning of the course of uh, the great uh, historian of medicine and French philosopher Georges Conguillam. And yeah, he, he argues, which is not the center of, uh, of the course, but he argues very forcefully and very beautifully um, for a different understanding of illness as an experience. Uh, of, of, and not as a, a, a sort of deviation from the norm. Um, so pathology as its own uh, experience. Um, I recommend the book. <laughs> well, I have to say that we are at time uh, and we still have questions in the, in the box. So that is a sign of just how much your topic and your compelling explanation of it is really raising the type of inquiry that we love at the Graham School. Um, let me just ask as a brief final question, you know, as you think about the learners who are going to be part of this, what are one or two takeaways, quote unquote, that, that you hope they might leave your class experience with? How do you hope it might change, you know, the, the way that they engage with the world, if that's not too big a, uh, <laughs> an ambition or question? Yeah, so I think the, the first is, you know, what I think every historian uh, wants is, you know, that they will have a, a better, more refined, historicized uh, notion of what normality is and uh, would not take it for granted. Uh, and this might bring along all kinds of questions and doubts about the, the sort of the pedestrian use that we make. In, uh, in normal and abnormal in our lives toward ourselves and toward others. Um, 
yeah, and I also hope that it would um, would be experiential in some way. Uh, uh, that the engagement with the materials will um, uh, will enrich the experience of people uh, in their own lives, um, and not just at the realm of their uh, whatever their um, uh, sort of body of knowledge or their intellectual. Uh, um, yeah. Well, I'll just close by saying that the chat has been full of people saying how much they have enjoyed this conversation and how excited they are about your class. And we're immensely grateful to have you teaching at Graham and also so excited about your peers at IFK uh, being part of our world and, and having the opportunity to bring the, I mean, truly groundbreaking work happening at IFK to a, a broader group of learners. So thanks to everyone who joined us this afternoon. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Arbel, for being such an innovative thinker who's helping us to better understand ourselves and the world around us. Have a good afternoon, thank everyone. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.